International News Now. So in its simplest terms, this nuclear deal exchanges an agreement by Iran to end its nuclear program, temporarily, for 10 years at least, by taking steps to prevent it from developing a nuclear weapon in exchange for the end of economic sanctions that have crippled Iran's economy, especially after oil price prices dropped significantly back in 2014 and 2015. Now, the potential deal offered both sides to something that they wanted desperately. The United States wanted a non-nuclear Iran, and Iran wanted the end of painful sanctions. Um, the deal then forces both sides to engage in painful negotiations with the professed enemy. In both the United States and Iran, there was strong opposition from strong domestic groups opposed to the deal. It was difficult for both leaders to come to the table and make concessions. Um, to reach this deal back in 2015. The deal included significant concessions on the part of Iran. It called for a substantial reduction of its stockpile of uranium, a sharp reduction of nuclear centrifuges for enriching uranium, and intrusive international inspections to keep Iran from cheating. These, these inspections were designed to monitor Iran's compliance. The whole deal was designed to prevent Iran from having the material and the, and the means for making nuclear weapons and to extend the breakout time for the country to develop a nuclear bomb, make it harder to do so. Under the deal, Iran does not have enough highly enriched uranium to produce nuclear bombs. It would take over a year for Iran to make a, a single nuclear bomb, which would provide time then for the United States and its allies to respond if Iran restarted its nuclear program. Now, without the deal, experts estimated that Iran had enough weapons-grade nuclear material to build eight to 10 nuclear weapons, and its breakout time back in 2015 was as short as two to three months. Now, in exchange for suspending its nuclear program, the United States and Western countries lifted crippling economic sanctions on Iran. Iran gained access to more than $100 billion in assets that had been frozen in banks overseas. And Iran was able to resume the sale of oil on international markets and then go ahead and begin using again the global financial system, banks in the, all around the world, to park its cash and engage in international trade. The net result of all this would bring billions more annually into the Iranian economy. Now, however, President Obama decided to pursue this agreement through an executive action by negotiating the deal with the leaders of Iran, but not initially involving Congress or treating the agreement as a treaty. A treaty with Iran on its nuclear program would have required ratification by a two-thirds majority of the Senate. Now, President Obama knew it, and everybody else did as well, that he never would have achieved that kind of support in the Senate because Republicans would have easily blocked the measure. So instead, he bypassed the treaty process initially by relying on his executive powers as a commander-in-chief to make agreements with other foreign leaders. This is an example of stealth multilateralism discussed in the module on Congress and foreign policy. The danger, of course, was that any future president could end the deal unilaterally through his own executive powers. Sound familiar? <laughs> now, despite being bypassed in the process, Initially, Congress then reinserted itself into this deal-making, and Senator Bob Corker from Tennessee was the major player in this reinsertion of congressional influence over the nuclear deal. Congress required that the president needed to certify the deal to Congress every 90 days. Now, President Trump certified Iran's compliance with the deal once at the beginning of his presidency, actually two times right. in the presidency, but all of the controversy and conversations over the last week are is that he is threatening to not certify that Iran is in compliance with the nuclear deal this time around. So where does all of this leave us now? The Washington Post, as we mentioned, has already reported that President Trump is, is expected to step back. This is after uh, his... Secretary of the Defense, Secretary of Defense was on Congress at Capitol Hill 
testifying before Congress and suggesting that it was a good deal and that the United States was going to stick with it. Stick yeah. with it. Um, so now we're going to run some clips and talk more about kind of where things stand. So what we expect uh, the president to do next week, a few days ahead of, of, of a deadline he faces, uh, is to say that, in his view, uh, the Iran nuclear deal, two-year-old uh, landmark deal negotiated under former President Obama, is not in the U.S., vital U.S. national security interest, uh, and that he cannot certify that to Congress. Uh, remember, this deal was not submitted to Congress as a treaty. Um, mm -hmm. Instead, it was uh, an executive action. And Congress, unhappy with that, passed a, a separate law that, that is on top of the deal that requires the president every 90 days to say that Iran is complying with it and the right. deal is in the national interest and should go forward. The administration doesn't like this deal. Trump's mm -hmm. made absolutely no secret of that. Uh, he's been heading in this direction for a long time. Uh, but they've hit a number of stumbling blocks, including that the IAEA and uh, base, and all of the U European allies, every other party to the deal, says Iran is complying with it. Mm -hmm. So what we expect him to do is use the second of those two grounds, which is the vital national security interest, uh, and to say that he does not believe the deal is in the vital national security interest. That kicks it to Congress under this law, which right. has about two months to decide what to do next. Okay. So as the clip points out, there's two ways that the president uh, was, two bases uh, the, that the president was going to certify uh, the Iran nuclear deal. One was about compliance, and as the commentator pointed out, there's various actors who have reported that, indeed, Iran is in compliance with uh, the terms uh, of the nuclear deal. There's some debate about that, and uh, there's some arguments from various members within the Trump administration that that's not completely true, and, and that, the, uh, that Iran is violating the spirit uh, if not the exact terms of the agreement. But he doesn't necessarily need to uh, base a decertification on compliance by Iran because there's this second leg of certification that uh, he is using to decertify the deal, and that is that it's not in the interest, uh, and it's not in the national interest of the United States. Now, what doesn't the Trump administration and Republicans like about this deal. And what the President Trump has argued ever since his speech to the United Nations is that Iran remains a bad actor in the region, that Iran uh, supports terrorist groups like Hamas and Hezbollah, as well as militants in Syria and Lebanon. The President um, uh, then uh, has argued that this is a terrible deal for the United States because Iran has gained tremendously in terms of economic resources and is going to use those resources to further undermine U.S. national interests in the region, whether it be in Syria, in Yemen, in, in other places, uh, in, in Iraq, uh, where they can use these new resources to their own national interests and against uh, America's national interests. And so, so what he is certifying uh, is that uh, the deal is no longer in the U.S. national interest, and thus uh, he is uh, going to decertify the agreement and uh, go from there. And so we're going to do another clip here uh, that gets into what happens next. And so what, let's uh, go ahead and run that clip. It's important to note in Ann Guerin's uh, scoop, as I, as I read it, the administration kind of wants to have it both ways. They want to decertify the deal, although Iran is not technically in violation of it. Uh, but they don't want to tear up the deal, which is what President uh, Trump, as a candidate, kept saying he, he would do. Why? For, for the reasons that you cite, the, the caps on Iranian centrifuges, on their stockpiles of enriched uh, uranium, on their heavy water stockpiles, all the, the things that would lead them to be able to quickly uh, resume their, their bomb-making program, 
those are, are useful, important limits. Nobody feels that more strongly than the Israeli national security community. You want to do some interesting reporting, ask Israelis, not the political side, but their military and security officials, what do they think? They answer pretty much the way General Mattis does. This is in our security interest to keep these limits in place. So I, as I see this, Trump going forward, not for the first time, is trying to have a little of both. He's trying to sound like the guy who says, that's it, I'm not going to certify, but he's not tearing up the deal, and it's important to note that. Talking to Iranians, they say, if that's the way it goes down, there are no new sanctions, we may continue to comply with the deal ourselves. Okay. So, let's be clear that decertification uh, really does not change anything on its own. It does not end the agreement, as was already just discussed, uh, or it, and it does not end U.S. involvement in the agreement necessarily. The decision to decertify simply throws the matter back to Congress. And this is something that the uh, Trump administration has done on numerous times now. Uh, the, he ended DACA, right, protections for deportation on DREAMers. And, but then he delayed the execution of that, throwing it back to Congress and kind of forcing Congress to make um, some pretty tough uh, decisions on this. So Congress now has 60 days to decide what, if anything, it wants to do in reaction to impending decertification. Now, this is expected to happen. It hasn't officially happened yet. He has until October 15th is the deadline. Uh, but all signals suggest that this is what uh, he's going to do. Now, this, uh, the Congress could take a hard line in response to decertification and reimpose harsh economic sanctions that existed before the deal. Now, this, of course, could then lead Iran to pull out of the agreement as well and then rush to build its nuclear program, which would escalate a conflict uh, between the United States and Iran. Uh, over nuclear proliferation and Iran's uh, uh, restarted nuclear program. The U.S. Uh, would then be facing two proliferators at the same time, which is something that I think uh, most actors want to avoid and most observers want to avoid. Now, Congress could also decide to do nothing, uh, and that's sort of what a lot of these commentators are expecting, is that they could do um, nothing and not impose any sanctions, or they could impose relatively weak sanctions that the European allies and others that are party to this agreement, Russia and China in particular, uh, that they don't have any objection to. And so in doing that, Republicans in Congress could take a symbolic vote against Iran, but not change anything um, about the agreement necessarily, especially the key component, which would be Iran pulling out of the deal and not complying. If there's no sanctions, what Iran has um, signaled, according to uh, David Ignatius, is that it would continue to co uh, comply. Let me add another layer of complexity here to what Congress could do with the sanctions. And, and there's some discussion, right? So the question is, will Congress impose sanctions, and what will that do to the Iranian nuclear deal? How's that going to shape Iran's behavior? Congress could impose sanctions on Iran, and everyone knows that we're not going to get the rest of the world to sign off on new sanctions as well. So it would just be the United States imposing economic penalties on Iran that limit its trade for its non-compliance or, or for the Iran nuclear deal, basically, because it's not in the national security interest of the United States. There's also the possibility that in order to try and get multilateral cooperation with the sanctions or generate multilateral cooperation with the sanctions against Iran, is that Congress could impose sanctions not only on Iran, but impose sanctions on anybody who trades with Iran. And this is that the political would, firestorm. That yeah. would really increase the pressure. Uh, and that's what a lot of um, folks are, well, s certain actors are calling for. Tom Cotton um, <laughs> is calling for this. In, in, but that's what the other parties to this agreement are, are worried about, because then they'd be forced to make a, a choice mm -hmm. between you know, trading with and dealing with the United States and uh, continuing uh, what has become a lucrative uh, trading relationship with Iran. You know, there's new avenues for investment, um, 
in the oil sector, in uh, Boeing and um, heavy uh, manufacturing, those sorts of things. So why decertify? Why is, is President Trump doing this and putting the ball in to the uh, court of the Republican Congress, right? And there's a number of reasons. Uh, one is that it appeals, arguably, to Trump's base, right? He, and he can claim to have fulfilled the campaign promise, at least kind of. Uh, by putting it on Congress, the president can perhaps have it both ways, that he's uh, tough on Iran, and uh, but then if Congress flinches or, or doesn't impose those kind of sanctions, he can blame them instead of himself. Um, he can also uh, earn some points here with Israel and uh, Prime Minister Netanyahu is pushing for this move uh, uh, quite strongly. Uh, but then at the same time, he can get the political credit for increasing the pressure on Iran, but also you know, stop short of this, what would be a firestorm of uh, problems for him if Iran actually starts to leave the agreement and make a rush for uh, building and restarting its nuclear program. And so I think he is trying to sort of have it uh, both ways. Now we got one more short clip here that brings in the final set of actors, and that is the other signatories to the agreement. There are many other parties to this deal, including China, including Russia, uh, the UN. And where does this predictably end, given that Rouhani has already been here in New York City saying, no dice, we're not going right. to renegotiate. You can go ahead and do all you want in Congress here in the United States, but th this is a closed case. We're not going to renegotiate. Uh, and we front loaded all of the incentives for Iran. So at this point, to front load the incentives, to give them all the money, and then walk away from the deal later, again, makes no sense. Because then they say, eh, well, we'll just start developing nuclear weapons at the pace of North Korea. OK, so let me just make one more point, and then uh, Pat has uh, another thing. Other signatories to the deal, Russia, European countries, China, have expressed their satisfaction with how the deal is working. So they could continue with the deal, force the United States to go it alone with sanctions, as we've already discussed. Uh, but. Uh, only if, saying, uh, if the United States only imposes sanctions on Iran and not those who deal with Iran. And this could uh, keep the deal in place as well. So just a couple of things here. First, let's take the North Korean angle. So if the United States says we need to get nuclear weapons out of the hands of the North Korean regime and wants to implement a policy to do that, how does it get North Korea to the bargaining table? if it cuts a deal with Iran and to halt the development of its nuclear weapons program and then two years later steps back or backs out of that accord. Okay. So this is, this is a big, these, yeah. these are now effectively linked. And there's a larger question here about the commitment of the United States and whether it sustains its agreements. And don't think about the negotiation with Iran as simply a negotiation between the United States and Iran and simultaneously impacts the negotiations between the United States and North Korea. And it's going to get a whole lot harder to get a deal with North Korea if we back out of the deal with, with, the, with, with Iran. Iran. And yeah. that's exactly what the leader of Iran said, is that no one will trust the United States if it steps away from this deal. Now, again, what the, what's perhaps missing from this story so far is that uh, President Trump could have reinstated sanctions all by himself. He didn't need to go toss it back to Congress. The way that sanctions are have been removed from Iran is through these waivers, and it's an executive decision to issue the waivers on the sanctions. He could have simply not waived the sanctions, and they would have come back into place unilaterally. And so there's some sign that he doesn't really want uh, to take that step, at least right now, and, and instead wants some, something short of that, some political credit for increasing the pressure, um, for fulfilling a campaign promise, for being tough on what he perceives to be a bad actor, um, and the like. 
One final point on this, and it's important when you hear debates about, and this is what we were just trying to do a little bit with linking this to North Korea, about the Iran nuclear deal. Don't think about this as in, in a political vacuum sense. It's a bad deal. The question is, well, if you pull the deal away, what's next? Right. And so we're going to assume that the United States still wants to prevent Iran from having nuclear weapons. So if you pull away from the deal, that creates incentives for Iran to restart its nuclear program and get nuclear weapons. Well, then how do you prevent Iran from restarting at that point if you take away the deal? And all of a sudden, the options get really bad really in fast. terms of do you just live with it? And if you live with it, then that creates incentives for um, Iran's adversaries in their region to start their own nuclear weapons program. Or if you don't want to live with it, and then you say, well, we need to think about using targeted military strikes to take out or punish the Iranian regime, to take out the nuclear program or punish the Iranian. Well, the, the US and Israel have already been down this route before, in 2008, and even look, perhaps in 2012, yeah, um, where, they had, where there were serious conversations about should the United States or Israel launch a preventive attack to take out Iran's nuclear weapon program. And both times, multiple times, they decided, no, that wasn't the best thing. There isn't a huge base of support in the United States, I'm guessing, for a significant war with Iran, which right. would you be stepping down? So the question is, what do you have, <laughs> when you're evaluating the deal, what do you have left if you pull the deal away? And, and if it, they do a military strike on Iran, what's, <laughs> what does North Korea take as a lesson yeah. for that? I mean. That further doubles down their incentive to build as many nuclear weapons as possible. Yeah, not only build as many nuclear weapons as possible, but accelerate their development of their ballistic missiles program to ensure their capacity to strike not just Alaska, but the eastern United States. So, right. And don't China's in the middle of this, too. Yeah. I mean, China, what's China going to uh, want to do uh, in, you know, about... Iran, when they have to think about North Korea right on their border, it's, uh, it's, it's quite a uh, delicate matter. Yeah. So, Don't think about these things in isolation, right? right. right. There's a larger Smaller. strategic systemic context here where these, these decisions are interdependent and foreign policy on Iran shapes other countries and can spill over and gener generate cascading effects.